Welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. I know that I said that the last episode would be a sub-episode, but then I realized after looking at the video that uh, I can't have this a sub-episode because we were at the heart of the mystery, which is uh, kind of an important part in the uh, general story. So, uh, well, I hope you didn't mind watching the crusade management there. Now, I want to skip another day because we want to finish the... Um, the task for uh, Master Zacharias, the Pillar of Skulls. So we'll just click Skip Day. And that finishes that. So uh, every palace needs an attentive and diligent Seneschal. In the commander's absence, Ziggurat business will be taken over by the Pillar of Skulls. A wonderful necromantic piece of work that Zacharias is ready to create for his disciple. Provided with necessary resources, the Lich will present the commander a new devoted assistant. And the Pillar of Skulls has been created. Now... Okay. Um, we do want to do uh, development. Uh, we want to expand these two outposts, but... Uh, we have to go to the Ziggurat and speak to Zacharias, I suspect. An odd and somewhat touched priest has sought an audience. In a dream, he saw himself eradicate the world wound and he is convinced that it was an omen. With the help of the relics he borrowed from his temple, he was able to make the arduous journey to Dresden, and now he is asking the commander to keep them safe while he is away on his quest to fight evil. What? I'm gonna go with this one. This isn't very helpful for a lawful evil character. The reduction of losses feat is a good feat, so... Convince the priest to join the army. Aru was able to convince the priest that he had interpreted the dream wrong. His mission was indeed to travel to the world wound and fight it, but he read the metaphor of closing the wound too literally. His true purpose is not to bear the burden solely on his own, sh his own shoulders, but to join the crusade and do his part in achieving victory over the demons by, for example, serving as a healer. Before we leave the city, I... we must remember to rest. Skipping a day is all well and good, but it doesn't replenish your spells. Also realized I haven't sold stuff in ages. So probably should go through the buffs again. I'll go ahead. I'll wait until we're level fourteen though. Can we rest now? No? How about now? Guessing this is the Pillar of Skulls. Before you stands a pillar with reanimated heads resting upon it, their eyes glowing green. All have been stripped back to their shiny, fleshless skulls, except for one that once belonged to an elderly man with a grey beard. The skulls greet you in unison, their whispers blending together in a chorus. Greetings, Master, by the Pillar of Skulls, we serve Kumar. Upon inspecting the elderly man said, you recognize Teldon, the museum custodian from the Tower of Estrod. His lips are crusted with dried blood and a fat black fly crawls across his cheek. We are created to advise you to control the cigarette to serve as shepherds for the undead, to ensure your safety, of course to help assemble the guards, use us as you see fit. Who are the grave guards? The cigarettes champions, 
its best guardsmen, strongest, more than just skeletons and zombies, those who seek to keep the defenses strong. Brave guards are never great in number, they are rare, they must be sought, collected, one by one, resurrected and subdued as long as their souls are strong enough. They will serve you well when the cigarette is under attack. They, certainly. Can you sense the souls of those who can become my grave guards? I already have an inclination that we have to go pick up Delamere for this. He sense rage. He sense shame. A powerful spirit. A suffering spirit. A traitor's spirit roams your dungeon. His god refused to claim his soul. Find him. Useful. That sounds like Staunton. Enslaved the spirit of Delamere, powerful priestess of Erastil. Her arrows will defend the cigarette well. Order her to come here. The pillar falls silent for a time, and then it cracks its jaws and speaks. We seek, but we do not see. There are no worthy candidates. We shall continue our search. I want to learn more about you. Our heads and our minds are a gift to you. A gift from the great Zacharias. Everything these heads contain is yours. Ask, and we shall answer. What are you? We are the students of the great Zacharias. He summoned us, and we emerged from our graves. Our duty compelled us. The great Zacharias joined us together. Now we are whole. We are the pillar of skulls. We are your servants. So Telden was actually a necromancer. Interesting. You're just a statue. What good are you to me? Knowledge. Magic. Wisdom. At the heart of the cigarette. Its mind. Its magic shield. We were once wizards. Who studied under Zacharias. We have no need for bodies while there is magic. The loyalty of seneschals and advisers is fleeting. They envy their master's power. They scheme and plot. We have no bodies and no ambitions. All we have is our service to you. Who controls you? Zacharias or me? The great Zacharias ordered us to serve you. He did not order us to serve him. We are a gift. You are our master. We regard our creator and teach with reverence. Still, belong to you. Thing is clear to me now. We serve. You command. I'm leaving. We serve. You command. There might have been a bump there because the microphone fell onto my chest because the uh, bolt that secures it is awkwardly placed um, compared to where I need the microphone to be. And I'm not sure if I would do that whisper thing later on. Um, because I'm not sure that it actually got caught on the video. I'll have a look myself or uh, listen myself afterwards. Let's uh, have a chat with uh, our dear teacher. Behold my creation, student. I fashioned this pillar of skulls from the heads of the clever, resourceful people, who can be useful once more. Now that they have been detached from their bodies, they can devote themselves entirely to serving you. Their advice will be wise and helpful, and the pillar will ensure order in the ziggurat. It's time for me to proceed with my work. Your soul is almost ready to accept the power of death. My work in this task has been magnificent. 
In the meantime, you may greet your new servant. One of its heads may seem... familiar. The lich's voice is full of malicious glee. Okay, let's, um... Well, okay, first, let's... First of all, let's take a, a, a thumbnail here, because this is a perfect thumbnail. So, there we go. Uh, let's head down into the dungeons and see if we can find uh, our good old friend, Staunton Vane. I, I doubt that we can find him down there, but uh, it's definitely worth it. Might be something that happens in a later chapter, though. Here's Nura, and here's Janna. Oh. Seek out the restless soul of a traitor in Dresden's prison and subjugate it. And this is the last chapter to complete the quest. So he has to be down here. Aha. Staunton's corpse looks horrible. Two whitish orbs where normal eyes once were. Rotten eyelids. The putrid stench of rotten meat. Flies are swarming the dead dwarf, eager to lay their larvae in it. Larvae? Yeah, larvae in his flesh. <laughs> you look decent enough as it is. <laughs> Sorry. That's my black humor kicking in. Jeez, that's... I'm sorry about laughing there. That is a horrible response. Well, let's awaken him. The corpse does not move, but you can sense Staunton's presence. His low, low voice resounds in your ears. Get lost! I'm dead! Agrim, the god of death is waiting for me. Will deliver me unto Phrasma's judgment. Me? I've had enough judgment here. No one will look at me with pity and disgust ever again. Go to the abyss. What do you want? And again, I can feel it. You too want to use me. Forget it. Uh, this one seems fun. You want to make things right. You want to serve me. Staunton drops his word like a forging hammer. Make things right. Wash away the betrayal. Avenge. The dead dwarf glares at you with his unseeing milky eyes. A generous offer. If this isn't some joke at my expense, I accept. The dead dwarf stands up slowly as though he is carrying a mountain on his shoulders. With repellent creaks, his stiff joints start moving. Staunton's face, a purple from post-mortem lividity, shows stern determination. The dwarf's low voice sounds even more grim than when he was alive. I'm at the ready, Commander. Waiting your orders. These are pretty horrible. I have... Let's, let's suck up a bit of him. I'm sorry for what happened to you. You've been treated cruelly. The dwarf's face, grim as, it, grim as it is, hardens completely. I've no need for pity. My punishment is just. Then again, Galfrey is a cruel bitch. She's guilty as well. What would you do if you encountered Minago again? The dead dwarf growls, barely able to contain his rage. She swore her love for me. She promised she'd stay with me until the end. She drove me to treason. Now I'm dead and that wretched bitch is still breathing. See for this, I have the right to seek revenge. Head to my ziggurat and guard it. Will do. I won't surrender this fortress, not even to Daskari himself. I know the way. Surprised that I can't interact with them. Follow my lead. Oh, <clears throat> how pleasant. Um, that was distinctly unpleasant. 
I have no idea what that was, but some graphical glitch with the flag, I think. Oh, there's the theater. Uh, let's... Um, let's head back to the citadel. X going on with the camera now. Uh, because I want to enact the... Um, upgrade thing for um, the outposts. How long does it take to walk through the city? It's a hand of the inheritor as well. This also seems to be one of... Oh. Okay. A Zacharias' irritated voice barges into your mind without warning. Student! The time has come. My preparations for the ritual are complete. Go to the ziggurat at once. I intend to grant you immortality as soon as possible, and then I shall depart this land once and for all. I'll come at once. Silence is your answer. Okay, well, I guess we have to go back to the ziggurat before I do anything, since that might mean that we have another decree that we have to do. Ugh. I'll walk back to the ziggurat with the uh, recording paused, though. Here we are. Let's see what his mastership wants this time. I don't entirely believe him. Zacharias beckons you impatiently. Perfect. Now that you are here, we can proceed. Remember this moment and accept fate's greatest gift to you. You, my young student, are about to discover eternal life and power beyond imagining. Right here, right now. A head-spinning aroma of overripe fruit fills your nostrils, and you notice the sweet taste of slightly rotten meat in your mouth. Two well-fed shaggy death's heads moths lands on your shoulders. You have pleased, Rogathoa. The pallid princess welcomes your transition to the bliss of undeath. Before we begin, explain what will happen. Zacharias waves you aside dismissively. Are you quite serious? It would take years for me to explain how my ritual works. To do so would be to defeat the ritual's very purpose. With the resounding cracking of his bones, Zacharias spreads his arms widely. Welcome to immortality, Commander. Spectral fingers grasp at your very being with immense power. Their predatory grip causes pain and odd numbness. You feel as though an unknown power is trying to rip your soul from your body, and it succeeds. You feel yourself drifting apart from your body. Your heartbeat slows, becoming distant and barely perceptible. Give yourself over to the power. Submitting to the spectral power, your spirit is smoothly released from its mortal flesh. I wonder if he's trying to subdue me. Suddenly, the spectral power disappears. Everything around you freezes. You look at your own breathless body with unexpected curiosity, and yet nothing happens. How odd. Precisely when the spirit was being expelled, I discovered a strange arcane connection between you and... Uh, something. Or someone. The connection is strong, yet its nature utterly eludes me. Have you ever been enchanted? Personally blessed by a god? Oh, that's not it. Hmm. You are a rather complicated personality, aren't you, student? One thing is clear. Unless we ascertain what produced these spiritual bonds, I shall not be able to perform the ritual without risking your life. If the ritual goes awry, we shall both suffer greatly. My oaths drain me of my power and reduce me to ash. Divination revealed to me a dark place, empty, like an old broken shell, yet still resounding with the echoes of the great deeds of the past. This mysterious place lies to the southwest. Go there and find it. Trust your senses. You will recognize its trail when you come across it. What exactly went wrong? 
your being was supposed to detach from your body, body effortlessly. Your ephemera is powerful yet defiant. Reinforced by my magic, it would be safe long enough for me to complete its metamorphosis and metamorphosis and place it in the phylactery. But this strange connection tightened and literally snatched your being from my hands. The course may lie in your powers of divine origin, which you have displayed several times. Whatever it is, I shall not repeat the ritual until we ascertain what we are dealing with. The consequences could be dire for both of us. Try again. Only when we know all there is to know about it. We cannot risk your life, for my oaths will be broken if the ritual destroys you. And if that happens, then no matter what your fate may be, I shall envy it. It does have a personal thing in this as well, where he he, he really wants to get loose of his uh, oath, I suppose. Can I find the source of the arcane connection that prevents us from performing the ritual? Zacharias shrugs. Somewhere to the southwest. At threshold, perhaps. Maybe on the way there. Maybe far beyond it. You must take care of that on your own, student. I am busy. Yeah, I thought it was a bit weird that he was going to transform me at this point, because that would have been extremely bizarre, considering... ...reasons. table and uh, enact that uh, in imaging. I'm not sure how I get the logistics experience that I need. I don't need much though, so it's obviously going up somehow. Anyways, let's uh, upgrade one of the outposts. Uh, I think the only ones left are relevant ones. Yeah. Okay, so I have to go have a quick nap, and then we shall head out again of the city, together with our trusted party. Are you going to get anything out of this book of yours? If you sell it, is there a chance you could get rich off of it? I have never even thought about it, Tiefling boy. I am generally of the opinion that knowledge should be free. Well, free. But not in... not without condescension. From her holiness. Just have a quick look at things here. Fighting the bleaching. Very relevant. I'm one, no. Yeah, that one. Um, I'm not sure about these items. There are some of them that I'm pretty darn sure we can leave behind. But. For now, let's just leave these items in my inventory. Uh, is there anything else that I... Well, there was these these two. I want to put those into the uh, personal chest. Not that one. Amber, amber, amber. Where did it go? Okay. Disappearing lines. Um, these don't weigh anything, but I also don't think I need them anymore. I'll just keep them for now. Okay, let's um, do that. I also forgot that we need to speak to the storyteller. That is not far. Does he have anything to say? I don't think he does anything. He does not. Uh, so, Erebeth? Social? He's obviously painting everyone. 
The cleric is drawing Irabeth. He sketches no grand ceremonial portrait. The depicted warrior looks weary, strained, but her resolute gaze, the proud set of her shoulders, and her solid grip on her sword make you realize this person is ready to fight to the end. I like the way you draw. I wish I really did look like that. You do. I don't make anything up. I draw only what I see. Thank you. God has grant that you're right. Oh, Commander! Hail! Good afternoon, Commander. How can I help you? Storyteller is down here. I can't make this a sub-episode either because of that skull thing. Kind of integral in regards to the... Um, to the... Um, Lich storyline, but I'm wondering if I should just stop doing the sub-episodes, as I mentioned in a previous episode. Uh, blah blah blah. I found a page that might interest you. The storyteller carefully takes your find. Yes, you are right. Another piece of evidence from the past I have forgotten. Okay, so the storyteller clenches the pages you brought. His voice becomes a bit younger and more energetic. It's been two years since I started to serve the darkness. She found me in the ivory labyrinth, her gaze piercing through all my protective spells as if they had been cast by an untrained apprentice rather than the last archmage of Kionin. She is powerful and insidious. It's the perfect assassin. Her name is Nocticula. She invited me to Elushinira, the city of demons in the depths of the abyss. The capital of the Midnight Isles. The Lady in Shadow highly values my ability to remain unnoticed. Kneeling before her throne, I listened to her praise and felt like a child being given a pat on the head for doing some simple chore for the first time. But this is no longer important. Now I serve a demon lord, for this is our agreement. She will help me decrypt the scribbles I copied in the Ivory Labyrinth, and in return, I will serve as her court mage and spy for the next 17 years. Now, Alishinira is my home and Nocticula is my lady in shadow. You trusted a demon lord? My lady in shadow has no reason to hide the truth from me. She does not care about my research. She offered to help me out of curiosity. I am something of a bizarre pet to her, both funny and useful. The storyteller shakes his head. She offered me help, and I agreed. I must thank my lady for her generosity. Seventeen years of service for translating seventeen phrases from Baph Baphomet's labyrinth. A bargain. Tell me about your life in Alushinira. Of all the places in the abyss, Alushinira is the most civilized. My lady wants to make her capital the face of the abyss, a place travelers from other planes can visit without too much fear. I don't care. I am here only to complete my service, get the promised reward, and return to Galarian. However, strange as, is, strange as it may be, Alushinira's demons treat me honorably. They hate me, sometimes growl at me, but they never attack. I prepared many spells and I'm ready to use them at any moment, but I've had no reason to yet. I have my own tower in the upper city, not far from my lady's palace. I've strengthened it with protective spells and set golems to guard it. I created a portal to Galarian at the top of the tower, one which only I can use. It will be my escape route if I need to flee urgently. I expect an attack every day, but it never happens. This might sound ridiculous and surprising, but I think the demons of Alushinira respect me. Please continue. The storyteller stays silent for a short while as if listening to something. I can't smell anything but sewage. I can hear some demon's snores or death rattles. Hidden by a cocoon of spells, I keep invisible watch in a dirty alley in Alushinira's lower city. Two winged shadows sweep past overhead and a terrible stone-splitting shriek rolls like a tide through the streets. But it can't hurt me. I know the ways of this city and I've protected myself from Vex Velexia's wild antics. My voluntary partner, a young half-elf named Kinney, sighs loudly and says yet again, They are not coming. I shrug, just as I have done every time before. I'm not keeping you. 
Kinney frowns and turns away in response. I sneak a look at my friend. His unruly locks fall over his face. Kinney carelessly sweeps them out of his eyes, thinking about something. I find myself enjoying his gentle movements and look away, embarrassed. Have a little more patience, my friend. Soon our goal will be here. Sure of it. Didn't expect to find out you had a partner. The storyteller's face lights up, and a timid smile appears on his lips. I didn't expect it either. Kinney is from Golarion, just as I am. He is a thief and a former slave. He escaped from the Cyclopes of the Dying Empire. I met him before I left Golarion for the Abyss, in my old tower. A thief who sought not my life, but shelter, a place to spend the night and protection from his former masters. My charms worked. Kinney couldn't get past the ground floor of the tower, and that's where I found him, sitting, sitting on the ground, entangled in my trap's living vines. I freed the hapless thief. I wasn't angry at his intrusion. I was even glad to talk with this restless youth of the short-lived folk. I had no idea how much I had missed companionship. After that, Kinney often spent the night in my tower, partaking of my hospitality. Together, we lived through the terror of Earthfall, and when the time came, I took him with me to the Abyss. Recently, he has even helped me carry out some of my lady's tasks. Tasks. Those that give him the opportunity to make some money. Does your partner know about your goal to save Golarion? Oh, yes. We've discussed my plans many times, sitting at the top of the tower, nursing goblets of, ch of warmed wine. Kinney shares my love for our dear Golarion and supports my desire to save its, save its doomed civilizations. The storyteller smiles warmly at the rush of memories. My friend is not like me at all. He is young, hot-tempered and mischievous. He prefers to act first and deal with the consequences later. Perhaps this is why we get along so well. Opposites attract. You mentioned Velexia. Tell me about her. The storyteller answers with reluctant admiration. The maddest succubus of all those born in the abyss. Even my lady in shadow can't but smile upon hearing of the latest mayhem she stirred up just for fun. Surrounded by her three succubi friends known as the Sinners, she flies naked over the city, crushing buildings with her raging screams, grabbing poor passers-by, taking them up into the air, and dashing them down onto the rocks, getting into raging fights with no rhyme or reason. Truly, Valexia is the bane of Alushanira, but also its wild heart. Please continue. Finally, my patience is rewarded. I see a slouching demon in rags, so pathetic that even the demon guards of Alushanira would not lay a hand on him out of disgust. But my spell-enhanced vision can't be fooled. I see the incubus, Siphorian the ruler of Alishanira, who answers only to the Lady in Shadow herself. Passing a step away from me, Siphorian stumbles and falls into a puddle of sewage, rousing disdainful chuckles from the few witnesses. But I won't be fooled by this game. Instead, I concentrate, becoming even more focused. My lord, I have discovered this crystal of unknown power on one of the Midnight Isles. Have a look. A hand holding a heart-sized crystal burning with purple flame emerges from under the rags. The incubus's hand is shaking, the skin on his palm slightly smouldering from touching the crystal. The demon's reflection in the puddle of sewage ripples and changes. I don't hear Siphorian talking to his mysterious lord. The incubus hides the purple crystal back under the rags. As you wish, my lord. No, Nocticula knows nothing about these crystals, I am sure. Of course, Lord Sokothbanoth. I wince. I have no desire to stand in the way of a demon, Lord. I turn around. See, Kinney? We were able to get evidence of Sephorian's treason. I was right. But my friend is nowhere to be seen. Who is Sokothbanoth? The storyteller cringes. A disgusting demon, Lord. Champion of meanness, debauchery, perversions, and breaker of taboos. He is Nocticula's brother and former lover. Out of jealousy, he tried in vain to kill my lady, but he remained alive after the attempt. He is driven by fear, shame, and hatred toward his powerful sister. 
It was an Ahindrian crystal. The story in Atella nods slowly. You are right. This is probably one of the first crystals discovered by demons, if not the first one. I'm glad it took demons so long to discover the crystal's true properties, otherwise the invasion by the Abyss could have happened much earlier. Please continue. I'm standing at the top of my tower. There is a goblet of warmed wine in my hand. Nocticula was pleased with my raid. Oh no, she won't kill Sephorion on the spot. My lady's punishments are much more sophisticated. Banishing, demotion, even transformation into the pathetic creature the Incubus was masquerading as. Nocticula has a lot of choices. I don't care. I've done my part. I sip from my goblet and turn to my friend. Without saying a word, Kinney takes out a rag from under his shirt and shows me the purple crystal wrapped in it. I chuckle. That's where my friend went at the end of the raid. Well, we are going to keep the crystal. I will study its properties in detail and find out if it will help us achieve our goal. Nocticula doesn't have to know that I have the crystal now. Better look to Sephorian or Demon Lord Brother for it. I drink from the goblet again and look down. Alushinura lies at the bottom of the tower like a faithful dog at the feet of its master. I earn respect here. Even the lady in shadow heeds my words. I feel a treacherous smile appear on my lips. Of course, when seventeen years have passed, I will return to Galarian, but for now I like my life here. The storyteller is quiet for a long while, thinking about what he saw, then runs his hand over his face, tired. I served a demon lord, and what's more, I liked it. I did not expect this from myself. I was completely different. Different thoughts, desires, motives. What made me change so much? I don't know. The storyteller shakes his head ruefully. Just getting it greyed out. Please, examine the items I'm carrying. Perhaps some of them could tell us a story. Let's give him the broken gauntlets. Restore this relic for me. The metal of the... The metal in the elf's hands shape, takes the shape of armor plates. The demon blood sizzles on them like a, on a red-hot grill and the essence is absorbed, leaving behind a grayish residue. This relic is called the Stern Hand. That was the name given to it by its owner, a Sarkorian witch hunter. The two gloves represent the bond between two beings. People who wear, who wear such relics do not live for themselves, but die from die for others. So we need more materials for the last one we have. Um, well then. That saving throw thing there? I'm not happy about that. He doesn't exactly have a record of having a high saving throw in will, this guy. Um... However, it could be given to the uh, animal companion. Wherever Pepsis. Ah, Pepsis a wolf. No, he is a dog. He has a world saving throw is seven as well. I'm not sure if I want to. Can't be equipped by this character. What? Specifically says that it can. Oh no, I have to uh, wear it on Caledon himself. That's not happening. I could use it on anyone, but I don't want the companion to start randomly attacking people in the group, so... Uh, let's head out of town and fetch Delamere. And then in the next episode we can um, can uh, go uh, on more adventures. Either the dragon uh, graveyard or uh, some other location.
for which one though. The episodes currently are not that uh, much action filled. Uh, we need to go to these locations though. Uh, we also need to figure out which one. There is one of these puzzles that we can complete. But yeah, let's head on to uh, Temple of the Good Hunt and fetch Delamere. There's no need for her to remain out here now. I'll go ahead. Delamere gives you a long look and her voice sounds pensive. You know, I still despise you, but this existence does have its benefits. Rastil forsook me, but I am loyal to him. I can still spread his word, defend his principles, but do not expect thanks from me. A task for you. I will obey, master. I will obey, master, though being your slave is a torment. Go to my ziggurat and guard it. As you command, master, I will guard your fortress. We go and then let's wait why did I identify her armor she's among my companions now isn't she just like Staunton was I need to level them up as well um... let us bide our time May just as well um, head on back the uh, old-fashioned way. Our feet. Probably have whining about fatigue, but I don't care. Not entirely sure where I went, why I went here, but it is quicker to go from here to the ziggurat than it is to go well oh okay lan rubs the reptile side of his face picking at the scales with his claw that's it commander i can't do it anymore i'm not a chief what happened i can't handle it i thought it'd be my people crying to you but it turns out it's me i just don't know how to make the right decisions let's try to figure out how to deal with your problems all right first of all aaron a girl from the tribe wants to marry an elf when did they even have time to get together? It feels like I'm the only one without a love life around here. Anyway, she needs the chief's blessing. They want to be married by the laws of the tribe, but I won't do it. He's an elf and she's a mongrel. Letting them marry means dooming them to eternal misery. It's wrong, but if I don't marry them, I'll be making her miserable now. My second problem. Five fools are so afraid of demons that they've hidden in the sewage system and refuse to come out. I've tried talking to them, pointless, and I can't just drag them out. I had a plan to lure them out with food, but I think they've found some down there. Rats here are definitely bigger than what we are used to. And the third problem? What should we do with the children and old people? This is a military campaign. Old people can do some household chores, but kids only get under everyone's feet. I have no idea what to do. You see? I'm not a chief. I'm probably the first person to ever ask this, but demote me, please. The first problem? Love is always a good thing, right? But how do I approve of a marriage between an elf and a mongrel? He'll be dead in 20 years or so, but he'll live for a thousand years more. I can't in good conscience bless them, but I can't stand in the way of their happiness either. Tell them that their decision is rash. Explain your point of view, and there is nothing else you can do. Sounds like a plan that should at least be considered. Damn it, I was hoping my problems were unsolvable. Second problem? 
I think maybe I should throw just throw a barrel of powder into the sewers and light the fuse. It's the only way to get those cowards out of there. But if I do that, then you'll get another fuse, and I don't think I like where you stick that one. I'll send soldiers to drag the cowards back to the surface. That easy? Huh? But maybe it could really work. Fine, I admit it. I just didn't want to think about all this. My head is spinning. The third problem? For some reason, I never thought the entire tribe would come up to the surface. I only ever pictured the warriors up here. But what do I do with the rest? I guess we could use the hungry infants to deafen the enemy. They scream so loud you can hear them behind the walls of Dresden. I can't think of what to do with the others. Um, let them... No, actually. I'll send all those who can, can't fight to Nerosian. They'll be taken care of there. I'll still worry about them, but I guess that's what it means to be a chief, right? Nothing to it. Here's a lesson from one commander to another. Don't be afraid of making your own decisions, but know that you can always talk to me. <sighs> Alright, lesson learned. I'll try to be as good as you. It's not the poor folks' fault they got stuck with the most useless chief in all of Galarian and maybe the adjacent plains too. A chief who is extra planar... extra plainerily bad, I'd say. Right, well, looking at the time, we uh, should wrap up the episode and uh, do the other things in the next one. So, yeah, if you do have any questions and or comments, then please do feel free to leave those in the comment section below the video as per usual. And for now, thank you all so much for joining me, and I hope to see you all in the next episode.